Uh, I'd like to say how delighted I am to be here this morning for a number of reasons, but not least is the one that Matt and Piers have already alluded to, uh, which is that this gathering, this convergence of these three projects is entirely a bottom-up phenomenon. This is not something that was mandated for us by the research councils, but as the result of our recognition as we explored each other's works of the convergence of interests and issues uh, which needed to be explored. And so I think that in itself... Uh, is just worthy of note. The origins of the climate geoengineering governance project, however, were somewhat different from those of the two projects you've just heard, which emerged from the RCUK SAMPIT process. The origins of CGG lie a little bit further back in this report, the 2009 report uh, of the Royal Society Working Group, uh, Geoengineering the Climate, Science, Governance and Uncertainty. Uh, the Royal Society, in its infinite wisdom, invited three social scientists and non-fellows to participate in the authorship of this report. Uh, myself, Gordon McCarran, uh, who's here, and Catherine Regwell, uh, who will be joining us this afternoon. Uh, and the report concluded, rather controversially for some people in the Royal Society, that the whole acceptability of geoengineering would be as much dependent on social, legal and political issues as on scientific and technical factors, and went on to recommend the implementation of governments, governance frameworks to guide, this is importantly, both the research and development and any possible deployment of climate geoengineering technologies. So as I say, the three sci social scientists involved in this uh, made a, uh, a proposal to the Economic and Social Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the responsive mode to explore the governance challenges uh, that seem to be uh, emerging around the whole issue of geoengineering. Uh, it was very clear that we were doing this to explore exactly the kinds of issues that Andy Sterling raised in his question to Matt. And I think uh, the whole point, Andy, there is that the, uh, when Matt says we need to understand and research, we need to understand and research exactly these social uh, relations and implications of technologies, as well as research on the nuts and bolts themselves before we make up our minds definitively uh, on whether we think any of these things uh, re represent any kind of uh, uh, helpful contribution uh, to climate change management or to societal development uh, more broadly. So we had four kind of principal goals to identify the different ways in which geoengineering was framed, uh, we've already heard a little bit about that from Matt and the sort of idea of astroturfing, whole variety of framings to explicate the problems of control or the challenges of controlling the technologies uh, right the way through from initial research uh, in computer simulations all the way through to possible deployment, to explore governance and regulatory requirements, what kinds of regulatory frameworks might be considered, and also to stimulate dialogue between key stakeholders. And as you can see, this brought together a variety of the social sciences from the three universities, Oxford, Sussex, and University College London. One of the first challenges that we have to recognize is, of course, that the very term geoengineering is itself controversial. It's a very heterogeneous uh, collection of very diverse technical practices which have been brought together under this uh, umbrella term. It's a bit like, in some ways, as Nick Pigeon and I uh, did a joint presentation at the University of uh, Ari uh, sorry, at Arizona State University a couple of years ago, where we pointed out it's a bit like nanotechnology, uh, in the sense of we're bringing together a whole variety of things which technically don't have much in common with each other, but we're bringing them together under this generic term uh, of geoengineering. So we actually need to be very careful when we're thinking about the governance implications to specify the particular technology that we're talking about, because a lot of things when we say geoengineering people by default think we mean uh, basically sulfate aerosol injection, um, but that's not necessarily the case. So we need to be very careful to differentiate. The second point is that what we're talking about here is essentially socio-technical concepts, early stage concepts. Yes, we do have a lot of computer simulations. We do have bits of kit. We have spray nozzles, for example, and aeroplanes and things like that. We have nothing close to a socio-technical system that is capable of delivering the kinds of outcomes that geoengineering currently seems to hold out the promise that we may be able to deliver at some point in the future. And that's another very important thing to understand uh, here. So it's little wonder that when we went, uh, some of us uh, were participating in the 2010 Asilomar Conference on geoengineering, uh, that there was a lot of politics of opting in and opting out, 
It was very interesting that there were those who wanted to reframe carbon dioxide removal simply as mitigation and to sort of be able to step out of the controversial arena of geoengineering. Uh, the forestry folks all wanted to say, no, no, mass forestation is not a geoengineering response because they were concerned about the possibility of uh, being subject to further regulation. On the other hand, the people who were promoting biochar desperately wanted to be included as geoengineers because they thought that this was the possibility uh, of developing further funding uh, for that line of research. We did a number of framing analyses in the project. I'm not going to go into them in details. Uh, but one which looked at the way in which Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia represented geoengineering showed a clear disconnection between the discourses of geoengineering uh, on Wikipedia and the mainstream discourse about climate change. And I'll say a little bit more about the need to reconnect those discourses shortly. We also conducted an expert framing analysis that Rose Kearns, Kearns will uh, uh, describe to you in detail this afternoon, which shows that experts were highly polarised about different constructions that they had uh, of the pros and cons of geoengineering. While deliberative mapping work done by uh, Rob Bellamy, who was also a participant in the uh, IAGP before uh, joining us on CGG, showed that there was a very strong public desire to discuss geoengineering precisely in the context of mitigation and adaptation, which was not what was not happening in the Wikipedia discourses, interestingly, but also to avoid premature closure uh, on geoengineering debates. Two particular problematic framings that we explored was the climatic emergency framing. This was one that was actually quite prominent in the Royal Society report and was quite popularly talked about around about 2009-2010. Uh, subsequently, that framing has been heavily critiqued, uh, particularly by social scientists who were concerned with the idea that um, emergencies don't actually happen. Emergencies are declared. Uh, they are, in fact, political constructions. And the idea of a climatic emergency uh, had real problems in terms of the potential for the imposition of undemocratic um, kinds of uh, forms of technocratic management of climate and the environment. It was also deemed to be impractical. When would you know when you were on the verge of a climate emergency? How soon before a climate emergency would you have to know to be able to in implement any of these technologies uh, uh, to counter it? The Plan B framing uh, was also problematic. Now, interestingly, the Royal Society report itself doesn't mention Plan B. That's only mentioned in um, uh, the President's uh, preface to uh, the report. Um, uh, but it was, a, nevertheless, a framing that was used quite prominently uh, in the uh, period 2010 uh, onwards. And that caused confusion because people were had different ideas about what was implied by this. Was Plan B a supplement to Plan A to do a little bit more, or was Plan B the thing that you do when you've given up on Plan A? Uh, and that also has caused confusion. And mercifully, I think that kind of vocabulary is now dropping out of the discourse. We did cost analysis, uh, and these cost analysis actually deepened the analysis that informed the Royal Society's uh, conclusion that all of the cost estimates you see on geoengineering are entirely overdetermined by the input assumptions. If you're an economist and you want to make any geoengineering technology look cheap, you select the appropriate assumptions. If you want to make it look expensive, uh, you will do likewise. Uh, so basically, you may see papers with pages and pages of complex economic formulae. Go back and look at the initial assumptions because they will in fact determine the conclusions at the end of the paper and you can skip all the formulae uh, and equations in the middle. You don't need them. But furthermore, the cost estimates that have been prepared ignore the social and environmental externalities. They only actually look at the project costs. So if we were to do uh, something like sulfate aerosol injection and find we were, uh, producing seriously negative effects, say, for uh, sub-Saharan Africa and decided, uh, you know, that that, uh, that, that was uh, problematic. Uh, that would certainly be problematic. Um, those costs are not included. So something that looks in terms of the project costs, uh, as sulfate aerosol injection is often uh, presented as being, as being relatively cheap compared to conventional mitigation, uh, if you start to bring in the potential environmental externalities, you have the potential for it to be very expensive. I'm not saying it will be, but you have that potential, and that's not adequately explored. What we do know from all the major projects literature, however, is that almost every major project that has been uh, developed turns out to be more expensive uh, than it was originally estimated. 
We explored climate ethics, and one of the findings that we had here was that, in fact, contrary to what's often claimed, uh, geoengineering doesn't pose new and distinct ethical problems, but what it does do is highlight aspects of problems uh, that are often neglected in the discussion of climate change to date and even of climate ethics, particularly for issues to do with trust, institutional trust, to do with liabilities, because there's a clearer cause and effect relationship here with a deliberate intervention in the climate than there has been with the accidental disruption of the climate caused by the historic emissions of fossil fuels, uh, and uh, consent issues about who would have to consent in order for us to engage in uh, either research or the implementation of these technologies at different geographical scales. And we also noted that these ethical issues, as they are discussed, are almost entirely discussed within the perspectives of Western philosophical traditions. Uh, we don't, for example, take into account Confucian ethics. Uh, and clearly, when we're dealing with a global uh, problem of this sort, we need to diversify the range of ethical discussions. We explored the global security implications of these technologies, which have given uh, rise to concern. Some people have been concerned that these technologies might be uh, weaponized, for example. Uh, that, we've decided, was highly unlikely. There are much easier, cheaper, and more effective ways of killing people, and much better targeted ways of killing people and causing terror than by trying to weaponize uh, uh, climate uh, uh, geoengineering technologies. It would also be a violation of international law, the Environmental Modification Treaty. But that doesn't mean to say that these technologies are without any security implications at all. The indirect threat of cross-border impacts is a very real one. Just imagine for a moment that India had done some sulfate aerosol injection experiments immediately before the floods in Pakistan a couple of years ago. I think you'd have had a very hard job persuading members of the Pakistani public and certainly Pakistani politicians that India wasn't responsible for the damage that had been caused. So you've got there the, the, the problem of perceived cross-border impacts. It's also the case, let's face it, that if we're going to implement things like uh, sulfate aerosol injection, it's highly likely that the bodies that would actually be doing it would end up being military contractors. In the US, it would be the Halliburtons, uh, the uh, Lockheed Martins. Uh, in China, it would undoubtedly be the People's Liberation Army that currently conducts a vast uh, array of activities in terms of weather modification. And the third thing that we considered uh, is the possibility of counter-geoengineering. There are some countries, I'm not going to uh, name them in this, uh, uh, in, at this stage, but there are some countries that perceive themselves as benefiting uh, from increased global temperatures, uh, and it's quite plausible that if uh, one group of countries were to try to geoengineer to stabilize uh, temperatures at lower levels, that in fact those countries that see themselves benefit might increase their emission of greenhouse gases as a countermeasure so as to continue to obtain what they saw as benefits. We identified this thing called the geoengineering paradox, which is that, in fact, the, what appears to be technically the easiest, fast-acting, most high-leverage technology, sulfate aerosol injection, might actually be the one that's most difficult to govern. I personally am known, I think, as a, one who has expressed uh, the view that we don't really need a single overarching global treaty to do most of the sensible things that need to be done in terms of mitigation and adaptation to climate change. That's a personal view. However, it's also my personal view that the one thing we absolutely would have to have a global universal treaty on uh, would be to do sulfate aerosol injection, precisely because of those perceived uh, global security issues uh, that I just mentioned. So what technically seems to be promising as being fast acting, uh, quick to be able to do, high leverage, would be extremely difficult to govern. Carbon sucking machines, however, uh, and putting carbon uh, in spent oil and gas wells or sequestering it in mineral form uh, is uh, something that would be relatively easy to govern because we have existing environmental and planning laws uh, under which we could actually conduct those activities. But think for a moment that you're going to have to reverse engineer 200 years of the fossil fuel industry. You're developing a vast industrial enterprise that would take decades to get to the scale where it's going to make a jot of difference to the climate. And then further more decades before the uh, emissions uh, or concentrations that were being removed by that vast industrial enterprise begins to have an effect uh, on the climate uh, system and the temperatures themselves. 
We explored issues of international law and governance. I'm not going to dwell on these. As I say, Catherine Regwell uh, is going to discuss these this afternoon. But clearly there has been a, an ongoing and continues to be an ongoing tension between advocates of top-down anticipatory structures, those who feel that there ought to be some kind of global treaty in place uh, even before research is conducted, and those who favour a bottom-up emergent ap approach to governance. Uh, we have seen that there has been some... Uh, in some areas, in some sectors, some support for the idea of the Convention on Biodiversity being uh, that overall uh, top-down uh, body, uh, but others have questioned whether that's actually a suitable role for the CBD and whether it has the potential to do that. But there is the question, how much of a comprehensive architecture do we require even before going on to research? And in the rest of my remarks, I'm going to be focusing on specifically on research governance. And there is, in fact, the question that's been very nicely articulated in two little books by uh, these gentlemen. One is, uh, of course, Mike Hume. Um, and Mike, the gist of Mike's book is basically we simply cannot know uh, enough about how solar radiation management would behave uh, to justify doing it. He talks about the models that we use being mere calculative cartoons relative to the reality that we have had to deal with. And in any case, he says it's morally reprehensible. Our ignorance will save us from folly. In an equally short and succinct book, David Keith, uh, a US engineer, uh, sets out a, uh, a program by which he believes that ignorance can be reduced by carefully constructed, carefully staged, escalating uh, research, uh, and argues that, contrary to Mike Hume, it would be folly to remain ignorant of our ignorance. So what kind of a, uh, where should we come down uh, on either sides of this kind of debate, or is there another route that we could steer through it? One of the things that is of particular concerns that those who call for a moratorium or a ban is this notion of the slippery slope, that once we take the first step in developing these technologies, then implementation becomes inevitable. Uh, however, uh, Counter to that, Gordon McCarran points out that we actually invested billions of dollars into developing fast breeder reactors around the world, and if you can show me a fast breeder reactor anywhere in the world today, uh, I will be very impressed. So the notion that there is a slippery slope is certainly uh, an, an unproven concern in this case. There's a range of dilemmas for the control of research. Who should govern and regulate it? And different uh, proposals have been made, ranging from self-governance by science, scientists, uh, through national government regulation, through the idea that research councils and funding bodies should regulate, or the idea that you ought to have some kind of overarching international regulatory framework. There is, of course, also a problem here of distinguishing geoengineering research from basic science. You could do the identical experiment and say, I'm just interested in seeing um, how uh, uh, droplets form around particles in the stratosphere because I'm interested in uh, stratospheric cloud formation or something of that sort. Uh, or you could say I'm doing this for geoengineering research. Um, do you only get to be subject to the regulation if you come out and say I'm doing this for geoengineering but you're not subject to it if you say you're doing basic science? And then finally there's another uh, very fuzzy area which is the idea that since solar radiation management, particularly sulfate aerosols, could only be fully tested at large scale, where is the cutoff point, if any, between the idea of research and implementation? And these are highly contested areas. Uh, they haven't been resolved. They continue to be subject to contestation. The third uh, goal that I outlined at the very beginning of my talk for the program here was to explore governance principles. And one of the things we have done is elaborated on the so-called Oxford principles uh, that a subgroup of us, uh, uh, including uh, Nick Pidgeon, uh, who uh, was participating in the IAGP and is here today, uh, presented to the House of Common Science and Technology Committee uh, in 2010, following up on the Royal Society uh, report. And we've elaborated these in much more detail in a an article in Climatic Change. I'm not going to go through them here. You can go and find them uh, online along with that uh, discussion in uh, Climatic Change. It's on the web. But basically, they are the notion that geoengineering should be regulated as a public good and in the public interest, that there should be participation in decision-making at the appropriate level, depending on where you're going from uh, computer-based research to outdoor research in a locality to uh, things on a national or international scale that there should be full disclosure of geoengineering research results, 
and open publication of all results. This is something which we thought was important given the light of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, which has tended not to publish unfavorable clinical trial results. We didn't want uh, that to happen in this instance. The idea that there should be independent assessments of the research and particularly of impacts. Uh, and finally, that the governance arrangements needed to be clear prior to deployment. Now, some people said, actually, these principles are so general they could be applied to almost any uh, potentially controversial area of technology innovation. My response to that is, well, why not? Uh, it probably would be quite a good idea, but they would need to be made specific in the instance of geoengineering. And this is where we combine the idea of technology-specific protocols with the idea of the stage gate uh, that actually emerged in the, uh, the SPICE project. The idea that, in fact, uh, at each stage of research, before res that stage of research is commenced, that there would have to be a, an assessment that shows how the Oxford principles were being addressed in that next stage of the research. Once that stage is completed, before you go on to a further stage, you would assess how those have been implemented in the previous stage and then specify how you'd assess them in the next stage. And it's our view that, in fact, a process such as this could give some reasonable assurance uh, that society retains the right to close down research and the capacity to make judgments to close down research should it, should it deem it appropriate to do so, but nevertheless allows in some sense a, uh, a process of uh, pursuit of uh, better knowledge and understanding in, at the same time. Um, and we would argue that in fact the cancellation of the Spice Balloon experiment, which some people described as a disaster, a catastrophe and so forth, was in fact a successful implementation of just exactly this kind of a process. Uh, and in fact, in the cancellation of that at the Science Media Centre, Matt Watson uh, explicitly invoked Oxford Principle 1 in light of uh, revelation of prior patent filing uh, by part of the team, recognised the inadequacy of the public engagement arrangements and identified the absence of explicit governance arrangements for uh, outdoor experiments, which were uh, in, obviously embodied in Oxford Principle 5. So I think, we've, uh, uh, I think Matt was very courageous in uh, that recognition, and I think it shows a potential way forward. Finally, we said that we were going to stimulate dialogue. We held a whole range of uh, workshops with stakeholders in the UK, India, China, and Singapore. Uh, the project has given lectures and presentations uh, around the world. We've had extensive engagement with international press and media. The Oxford principles have been widely cited, sometimes approvingly, sometimes disapprovingly, but at least they've had an impact uh, on the discourse. And the UK, I think, is recognised as a leading, think leading serious thinker on, uh, on geoengineering. Uh, the other two countries, I think, which are leading in this respect are the US, which probably has a bit of a reputation for being more gung-ho than we do, uh, and Germany, which I think has probably a re reputation for being a bit more reticent uh, than we are. So we seem to be somewhere in the middle of, uh, of that spectrum. Finally, there are two qu sets of questions that we would ask uh, going forward. Uh, the first question is, what can geoengineering do for the climate? This is the obvious question from the policy point of view. We would argue it needs to be firmly relocated in the context of mitigation and adaptation discourses. Um, we are concerned uh, as to whether the CDR technologies that are assumed in RPC 2.6 could in fact be scaled up uh, to the level necessary to have the impact that they are assumed to have on temperatures by mid-century and the end of this century. And that while solar radiation management promises high leverage and fast acting impacts, uh, it would be very difficult to govern. So the outcome of this suggests that in fact, if we want to save lives and property this century, not only do we have to be talking about mitigation, which will have a long-term benefit, but it would be prudent to put increased emphasis on adaptation. But this isn't the only question that social scientists ask. We also want to ask what can geoengineering, particularly geoengineering discourses, do for society? And I think one of the things that's very interesting about this instance uh, is that at the moment, unlike the development of things like nanotechnology and GM disputes, um, the discussion of values is right up front. We're having the discussion about values uh, beforehand. And this is something that social scientists and people advocating responsible innovation have argued for for a long time. And it's really interesting because at this stage, there's little science to hide those values behind. And usually that's what happens when you get further down the road with the development of a technology, is we then start to move into having a surrogate argument about the technology, which is really an argument about the values. So it's really interesting from our point of view that geoengineering provides opportunities to explore things like the way we think about nature 
uh, what we think is the good society, what's the role of, of technology in our lives, uh, what are the implications for social justice of technological interventions and so on and so forth, and what can geoengineering teach us about the governance of other global emerging technologies. Thank you.